Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. Welcome in listeners to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast, where we're always talking everything college hoops. You could have been anywhere else on the dial, but you chose to be here with us, Mike and Gus, and we appreciate that. Uh, Listeners, we hope that you're getting geared up for the college basketball season, and to help you do so, the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast is trying to bring in some esteemed guests. Luckily, we have another one here just for the listeners. Rob Doster of NBC Sports was kind enough to give us a little time to talk everything across the college basketball spectrum landscape. Rob is the award-winning writer for NBC Sports. We'll get into that a little bit later. He is the host of the College Basketball Talk podcast. You can also find all of his workings over at collegebasketballtalk.nbcsports.com. And if you're looking for a little bit more Rob Doster, like everybody might need in their life, uh, go dial up his YouTube channel. Punch up YouTube, punch in Rob Doster, and some college basketball-centered things will pop up into your ears, into your eyes, into your senses. So Rob and I got to talk a whole bunch of different things, luckily. We got to talk uh, Kansas and Snoop. Right, That sounds about something appropriate to talk about. Of course, we talked SB206. We talked about Coach K's comments on the name, image, and likeness uh, that he spoke on at ACC Media Day. We talked about Georgia Tech sending thank you notes. We talked about a couple of players that might catch your eye and maybe a sneaky team or two. We talked a little bit of a player that might be under the radar out west and his uh, Robin to his Batman. And uh, we even covered a couple of good craft beers and a couple of LPs and albums that you might want to put your ears on when you're not listening to this particular podcast or Rob's podcast. So we hope you enjoy the conversation. And uh, look, here at the Screen Screener po- College Basketball Podcast, we maraud for ears. Don't be afraid to give the podcast a follow on Twitter at SDS Podcast, efficiency of keystrokes, of course. Please don't forget to leave a really kind review if you really like what we're trying to do for you guys this season uh, as the season sneaks a little bit closer. I don't know, leave five stars, leave some kind words uh, over at your iTunes or your podcast consumption vehicle of choice. That'd be really cool. Kindness is always cool. And uh, please don't forget to give Rob a follow simply at Rob Doster, capital R, capital D for Doster over on Twitter. Cheers, everybody. Welcome in, listeners, to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast, where we're always talking everything college hoops, and we have a great guest for the listeners out there to talk exactly that. We have Rob Doster, the award-winning writer from NBC Sports. He's the host of the College Basketball Talk Podcast, which you can find on iTunes, and of course, you can dial up all of his information at collegebasketballtalk.nbcsports.com. Rob, thanks for giving the pod a little time here. Honored to house your voice, your opinion, your tastes. Really thankful, man. Not a problem, man. And and just to clarify, I'm an award losing writer. I've never actually won an award. So I just want to make sure everyone understands that I am an award losing writer. I'm really good at losing those things. Listen, we will have no self deprecation and no negative self talk on this podcast, Rob. My uh, daughter did like the girls on the run uh, program for cross country. And we had a conversation at dinner one time where, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I spit out something that was a little negative like that. She said, Daddy, there'll be no negative self-talk at the dinner table. So <laughs> I'm tolerating that at I any like that. All right. Uh, so, Rob, it appears that we might need to start with, like, Kansas, but there's a ton of things to hit on here. Bill Self digging in the crates, Snoop at the Fog. I mean, you wrote about this very topic about uh, that particular piece over at uh, College Basketball Talk at NBCSports.com. So do you want to give us, like, your two cents on uh, Kansas – what their motivation might have been for releasing that and then the actual actions that took place at the FOD? Well, I mean, first of all, I I, I think you have to give uh, Snoop Dogg a little credit. He went on Howard Stern, I guess it was last night, and he said that if if you hire Snoop Dogg, you're going to get Snoop Dogg. And, like, I 100% agree with that. You know, I don't I don't buy into this idea that Kansas was like bamboozled by Snoop or anything. You know, you know what you're getting when you hire him and you bring him in and you ask him to perform. And, you know, I I understand kind of why they might be a little upset based on the reaction that people had. And I do understand why a college basketball program probably shouldn't have a rapper walking around shooting fake hundred dollar bills at uh, pole dancers. We can't call them strippers because they had their clothes on, but they were dancers on stripper poles. It's probably not a good look to have somebody walking around shooting a hundred dollar bills on those uh, dancers on stripper poles during a midnight madness celebration. So I understand why Kansas like had to come out and kind of backtrack what they did and and, and apologize to people. But I mean, you hired Snoop. What do you think is going to happen? 
I'm just surprised that there was no drug paraphernalia that was involved either. Like it could have been, it could have been even worse. Like as far as <laughs> the visual that came out of it. So I, I think they should be thankful that that's all they got, all, all they had to deal with. To be honest, I mean, the only way it could have been better is if Snoop walked out there smoking a blunt while he was shooting fake hundred dollar bills on uh, dancers on stripper poles. That's the only way it could have been better. Uh, pr- yeah, I pretty much. I totally agree with that. Okay, so what do you think uh, juxta like the effects of this event juxtaposed to the results? of this summer's F- FBA, FBI findings, like how, how does that intermix? And do you think that those things should butt up against each other? Or you think they're just two isolated incidents? Well, you know, I, I think that there's definitely an element of Kansas, like trying to troll the NCAA with all of this stuff they're doing. Like, I, totally. I don't know if you guys saw the promo that, that Kansas put out for um, Snoop's performance, but it was Bill self walking into a record store uh-huh. and picking out, I think it was ain't nothing but a G thing. And he's wearing like this T-shirt with the biggest Adidas logo I've ever seen. Like, I don't think that you can actually buy T-shirts with Adidas logos that are that big. He had to have gotten that custom made specifically for that promo. You know, you have Snoop coming out just completely decked out head to toe in Adidas gear. Right. Uh, I think that they're very much leaning into this. And while like I am 100% here for them doing this trolling, like I hate the NCAA. I hate amateurism. Um, Mm. I'm... I'm fine with Kansas throwing that in the NCAA's face and kind of laughing at them because, like, let, let's do this, man. Like, they might go out and make the Final Four win a right. national title this year. I, I'm here for that drama. I'm here for that messiness. But I just want people to remember that while Kansas is doing all of this and while we're laughing at Kansas, like, Kansas played the victim when right. these things went to trial. And there's there's three men specifically from this trial where TJ Gasnola testified that are mm-hmm. heading to federal prison because they broke NCAA bylaws. Like, that why they're in prison. I know it says wire fraud or bribery, whatever those charges are. But the simple fact of the matter is the crime that w- that that was committed in the eyes of the federal courts is that these guys made these athletes ineligible, did not tell anyone they were ineligible, sent them off to Kansas where they received uh, scholarships that they were not eligible to receive. That's the fraud right. right there. That's the crime. That's Kansas playing the victim because they were duped. They didn't. They they, they were bamboozled, blindfolded, whatever you want by by the mm-hmm. by Jim Gatto and TJ Gasnola. As a result, like Gatto's going to jail. So like well, we can sit here and laugh and make fun of the NCAA and, and enjoy Kansas leaning into this trolling, but just remember that like Jim Gatto's family is probably not thinking that this is pretty funny, considering the fact that one Kansas put out like a victim in- impact statement that helped get those guys sent to prison, and two they tried to bankrupt that dude's family. They asked for a million dollars in restitution. Like, do you think a middle manager at Adidas right. just has a million dollars laying around after he had to go and defend himself for a year against federal charges? So, like, it's funny, and I'm going to enjoy it, but I just can't ignore the fact that Kansas helped put these men behind bars. Right. I think the part, I don't know, not unnoticed, but at least is not like acknowledged, like the collateral damage of that just doesn't, it's not a great result as far as, as far as I'm concerned. And, and you mentioned the amateurism. So let's, let's get to the hot spot, the hot topic, right? The off the court leading up to the season start with SB 206. Now is California law. It's got some clout behind it with LeBron being part of the signing. Okay. So Rob, what does this law mean? And with other states lining up like similar legislation in the future, and then also with SB 206, I'm sure we're kind of in lockstep here a tiny bit. Is it the starting line of the deconstruction of NCA's antiquated hold on amateurism? Like, what do you think this means, like uh, short term, long term and moving forward? I do think that it, it I mean, eventually it's going to change, right? Either the right. NCAA is going to accept this idea that players can profit off of their name, Im- image and likeness or the NCAA just I, I don't want to say it's going to fail to exist because I think there's just too many teams and too many conferences and too many different levels for it to completely go away. But I would not be surprised to see like, I don't know, maybe like the big power conference schools end up leaving and starting their own thing if they decide that this is what they want. But the other part of this that that we need to make sure we mention is that like the, the NCAA is made up of the schools, right? Or the, right. the schools don't want this. They want to keep amateurism. They don't want to give up this change. I think that they've made that made that quite clear. So I don't I don't know how long this is going to take. And honestly, like I think that it's probably a bad idea in terms of how this thing will progress and, and, and how it's going to affect the sport and the teams and the players and all of this. I think it's going to be an absolute mess if this yeah. is something that gets forced through by congressmen and forced through by politicians. That said, 
they have to do this and we have to support have them to. doing this because there's no way that the NCAA is going to make the decision that they, that they're, they're not going to make the right decision. They've right. been around for what, a hundred years for like the last 20 years. People have been saying that this is, this is a scam. This is ridiculous. These players should be getting more. Uh, they shouldn't be signing away their name, image and likeness rights. And they've done nothing. The NCAA is not, they started a w- working group this summer. That's all they've done, a working group. So I, th- I, I'm, I support this idea that politicians had to push this through. I wish it didn't come to this because I think that it's going to be, it's not going to go all that smoothly to, to make this transition as opposed to the NCAA accepting what they have to do and slowly making the changes over the course of like the next year or two. It's just going to get thrown in. There's going to be some states that are allowed to have it, some states that aren't. It's just going to be a complete disaster because the NCAA refuses to change. And I think it really is that simple. It kind of is that simple. And you know that they're going to try to hold that firm grasp onto the amateurism model and the current model that yields them literally billions of dollars uh, each year to do TV contracts and, and beyond revenue sources. So the fact that they're just going to hold that tight grip and then slowly but surely like states are going to be peeling away at that tight grip. And it's like you said, it's just going to be messy with all of that peeling and all of that, all of those states making individual decisions that are isolated from the NCA, which is a big conglomerate of all. The here's, here's the other thing about it that I don't think gets nearly enough attention when it comes to college basketball specifically. Like we have a uh-huh. serious talent drain po- problem in the sport. Yeah, There were 87 guys that went pro last year with eligibility remaining. That's right. that, that half a third of them didn't end up getting or more, it was impossible for a third of them to get drafted. There's only 60 draft picks. Right. Right. And it's because if you think about it, like you basically your your professional career is basically like from 20 to 30. Right. More or less. And it's a 10, ten year window. Yeah, you're right. More or less a 10 year window. And if you stay in school one more year, that's more or less 10 percent of your earning power. That just evaporates by staying in school when you can go, maybe you're not going to get drafted, but you can go get a, a two way contract. You can go get a $50,000 um, training camp bonus. You can go, go overseas and maybe you make like a hundred thousand dollars playing in Spain yeah. or in Italy or something like that. Maybe you make more. Maybe you end up being like Nigel Williams Goss and, and uh, that's the uh, name that was inside my head. Great example. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you kill it over there and you make a ton of money. So it makes sense for a lot of these guys to leave. Now, I don't know. Just how much money opening up name, image, and likeness rights actually would provide for like a, the, the big scheme and the, the the players overall, but I do think that in certain situations, it would be enough money to to make these kids consider staying for another season. I, I you know I think the perfect example would be a guy like Martin Crampel. I think that's how you pronounce his name. The guy yeah, the, yeah. he was the center at Creighton right. last year and ended up leaving. Like so, Creighton is in Omaha. Omaha loves the Blue Jays. They sell out an NBA-sized arena yeah, for every 000. home game. Yeah, 18,000 people, home games. Even They did this when they were in the Valley. Like People there absolutely love Creighton. Now, I understand why Crample ended up having to go pro. Like he's, I think he's 24 years old. He's had three mm-hmm. torn ACLs. Like You got to go out and start making money at some point. Yeah. I'm convinced. Like he, he wasn't ever going to get drafted. He's going back overseas to play professionally. Like he's he's, he's going to be a, a guy that plays in Europe for like eight, nine, ten years. And I am convinced that if there were boosters that were allowed to be able to uh, endorse him and, and to, to give him some money to you know promote their whatever car dealership, that's the example people love to give out. Whatever right, it is, right. I'm convinced that he there th- there was a number that they could have made that would have been able to keep him in campus uh, on campus for another year. You know, I think it's places like that. Maybe a place like Murray state that has a huge passionate fan base, maybe a place like Wichita state where uh, I'm sure the Koch brothers would have no problem making sure that Wichita state players are going to be convinced to stay for an extra season. If that makes sense. So no, that makes, that yeah, makes perfect sense. Imagine if you have Landry Shaman around another season, like that was, yes, that was a guy like that or, yeah. Or like maybe um, imagine if Amir Coffey was still at Minnesota. I think Minnesota would be much better this season. Imagine if Tremont Waters ended up coming back for another year at LSU. So there's a lot of guys in these situations where allowing them to be able to tap into some of their their income and money making potential while going back to school is going to keep them in school for a little bit longer. And, and you know, remember. We have the HBL starting next year, the historic basketball league that is going to allow kids to be able to get scholarships, be able to play professionally, and they're going to get paid to do it. There is the NBL out in Australia. There is kids are going to be start. They're going to be allowed to go pro straight out of high school coming up probably in 2022. There is uh, you can go straight to the G League right now. You can just skip college and go work out for a year. Um, like Beasley or like Mitchell Robinson, like any one of those examples, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it, like any of these guys. So there's plenty of avenues to go out 
and make money as a basketball player without going to college. And and at some point, you know, the the NCAA's cash cow is the NCAA tournament. I think it's what, like 75% of the revenue that the NCAA brings in every single year is based off of what they get from CBS and TBS with these TV contracts for March Madness. What happens when the product in March Madness starts going downhill a little bit? What happens when that cash cow isn't producing the the same level of milk? So I would be very worried about that if I was the NCAA and I was in charge of uh, making sure that that money was still coming in. And it would be something that I think would I would be cognizant of because your product is going to get better if you have better players there. And the way to attract better players is to let them get money. It's the same way, you know, if you're trying to hire um, somebody at your law firm, like if you're offering half of what the big law firms are, like you're not going to get as good of a candidate. If you're trying to hire a writer and you're paying them $20,000 a year, you're probably only going to get a certain level of writer. Whereas if you have $120,000 to spend, you can, at, <laughs> at this point, you could probably go out and get whoever you want. So People are, I, I don't think, I don't understand why people are so against the idea of athletes being able to make money off of what they do well when everybody else in the world is looking, is trying to find a way to make just that much more money off of what they do well. I, I totally agree. And I think this was, you know, talked about in other places, but like just some of the ancillary items that these student athletes can benefit from, whether it be uh, the, the, the swimmer giving swim lessons, whether it be, I, I don't know, like the, 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 the pitcher giving pitching lessons on the side, uh, whether it be the softball pitcher doing the exact same thing, like all of those lines of revenue could be like really profitable for and those. Here's here's another one. Dan Wetzel had a great point in a column that he wrote about this. Imagine okay. what happens if you are the point guard at Towson or something like that, and you end up making a three in the first round of the NCAA tournament as a 15 seed to upset the number two seed. You hit that buzzer beater, and then yeah. you go on Twitter and you post your Venmo on Twitter. How much money do you think that that guy's going to get coming into his Venmo? Well, yeah, just like, you know, start the, you know, start the calculator now. Like that thing's going to happen. Yeah. It's little things like that. And, and, you know, honestly, like we talk about this with just college football and college basketball and even like women's basketball players and and, um, sports like that. But it's not just them, man. It's like, it's the gymnasts that are in college that are also competing in the Olympics. It is who's the girl that she was the swimmer at Stanford. She, I think it's Katie Ledecky. Katie Ledecky. Yeah. Yeah. She won like 8 billion gold medals, but then she went right. to college and she left college early. Cause she was like, this is stupid. Like I, I'm going to go right. out and get paid she to be on the front of a Wheaties box. She literally had a six figure contract waiting from speedo and then had to decide, am I still going to be like a Stanford Cardinal or am I going to go make this six figure, you know, stipend from this company that wants to uh, support me and uh, have me part of their brand? Like that was a legit decision she had to make because of the NCAA rules. Yep. And nobody wants to talk about that because she's just a swimmer. No one pays attention to swimming more than what? Once every four years. Kitty Lebeck is awesome. They should pay attention to her. Uh, All right. So let's, um, but let's uh, talk about one more thing. Uh, ACC Media Day, Coach K recently like commented on the name, image, and likeness, who we had on last week on the podcast. Matt Norlander wrote about this, your buddy. It seems like he wanted to get ahead of this a little bit. What was your take on his comments at uh, ACC Media Day as far as? players getting pl- uh, paid for their name, image, and likeness. I'm not that surprised because of what he has to do to recruit and who he has right. to recruit against. You know, the, I think John Calipari has kind of driven this bandwagon and been the leader of this 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 movement um, dating all the way back to what, like 2010 when he, he first started recruiting these guys and, and making his sales pitches. So I understand why he did it. I do think it's notable because I think Coach K like might be – I don't know if there's a more powerful voice in college athletics when it comes to a coach. You know, maybe somebody like a Nick Saban, but I don't think he's quite as visible as Coach K. He's like Coach K coached what Team USA, yeah, so the Olympic team. yeah, the Olympic team. So I, I think it's it's significant because he's come out completely on the opposite side of this from Mark Emmert, and I think I would argue that Coach K is probably more powerful or has more sway on public opinion. Than Mark Ember does. Well, that might not be true because I think anybody, when as soon as Mark Ember speaks, I think most people probably just completely ignore what he says, and it just he does a really good job of people like going the opposite direction of what he wants. So maybe that's not true, but I, I think it's significant. I'm not all that surprised that he said it, and I th- I don't know. I honestly don't know if this is something that he truly believes or something that he feels he has to say in order to keep recruiting the guys that he's been recruiting. But I don't think it matters. Like I, I'm glad that he came out and said it, and I think that it's. It's important and it's significant and it's probably something that's going to keep keep this movement going in the right direction. That's exactly what I was going to like just comment, uh, piggyback on what you said. I think it's just going to add a little bit of momentum 
set the conversation headed in the direction of SB 206 and, and other states that are going to have legislation up and running, especially like Florida. And just let, one other quick thing from, from you know, the ACC, like it, it totally swept under the rug under all of this, Rob, is like Georgia Tech should just send out, send out some thank you notes, right? Because otherwise they might be the head story. We might be talking about them. And, and right now, like they're le- legitimately an afterthought in this conversation. And I'm sure in many other college basketball conversations across the nation, like they, with what they were hit up with their uh, limitations and then uh, how the NCAA threw the cuffs on them a little bit. But now, like, I don't know, we got Coach K talking about name, in- image, and likeness, California passing a law, Kansas and Snoop Dogg, like Georgia Tech's like, oh, oh, well. To be fair, I'm not sure the last time that uh, Georgia Tech wasn't an afterthought in college basketball conversations. But, yeah, yeah I do think you're right in that um, people, people completely forgot about what happened. I do think it's hilarious, though. Like this doesn't get talked about enough. Like this whole thing happened. They got all of these violations because yeah. Josh Pastor didn't send what like a happy birthday card to his guy who ended up being like this psychotic con man who also was his bag man and made sure that like it was was trying to get him transfers and paying players that he didn't know about. So I, I think that the entire situation like it's just absolutely absurd, and I don't think people realize just how crazy all this stuff was. Like they had to go to court for a long time because this guy made false sexual assault allegations against against Josh Passon, right? Yeah. So it's just, I really it, remember that. It, it's, it's such an insane story. And there's a, the, I don't think there's a better summation of Georgia tech basketball than that. They got banned from the postseason in a year right. where they had no chance of making the postseason because a former player and a former assistant brought a kid to a strip club, Wendell Carter, that they didn't really have any chance of getting and, and gave him $300 to spend at the strip club. And they got caught because uh, they got caught because an ex friend of Josh Pastner went to the NCAA because Josh Pastner didn't wish him a happy birthday. That sums up Georgia Tech basketball to a T. Uh, you said it perfectly. That's uh, <laughs> just right. Okay, let's tie a bow on that one. All right, let's jump on the court, Rob. Uh, you released the All America your All America teams in the top twenty five over at NBC Sports. Please go check that out, listeners. All right, so Rob, educate the listeners uh, here a tiny bit. Maybe have one player who you think is like massively underrated or undervalued coming into the season who might explode and uh, just like really get into our, 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 you know, to the right in the front row. Maybe not exactly like John Morant or exactly like Trey Young, but maybe that type of impact that just might explode and really surprise us this year. Well, I don't know if there's going to be anybody that puts up numbers or has a season quite like either of those two guys. I think that they were, uh, they were special talents and I don't, know if I see anyone quite like that this season. I do think that people are going to be surprised at just how good Miles Powell and Seton Hall end up being this season. Like I'm all in on that bandwagon. The thing about Powell is he's just so much fun to watch, man. Like he, he is he has like range legitimately out to like 35 feet. And he's one of these guys that might miss eight in a row in one half and then hit seven in a row in the second half. Yeah. Um, so and he's a the, lot of fun to watch. The movement of the three point line is not going to affect him one single bit. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, he's, he's one of those guys that is kind of, uh, you know, 28 feet, 22 feet, whatever it is, you know, that's, that's in his range. So I think Miles Powell is a guy in that conversation. Um, in terms of like a, a breakout player. So I'm kind of torn on this. I'm, I'm curious your opinion. So heading into the offseason, like my first thought was, okay, Mamadi D. Kite is going to end up being the dude for Virginia this year. And that's because. Okay. I thought he was like, he's just such a good defensive piece in terms of his ability to, you know, protect the rim, his ability mm-hmm. to be switchable. The fact that you can kind of put him on pretty much anybody and he's going to do fine defensively. Yeah. Like, I just think he's such a, a, a big weapon. And the way that he played down the stretch in the tournament, what he was, he, you know, he, he took over games at some stretches. I think that he averaged, what was it like 12 points and nine boards in the, in, Virginia's NCAA tournament run. Then someone's probably going to end up correcting me on that. But no, that's uh, a, that he, sounds close. that sounds close enough. I don't have it up in front of me, of course. Yeah, he was he was very very good in the tournament. And I expect with more uh, shots available, his production his production is going to the, the arrows pointing straight up. But at the same time, like I think Braxton Key is a guy that uh, can step in and play the DeAndre Hunter role. Like I don't know if he'll do it as well. But you got to remember, Braxton Key is a guy that did average 12 points as a freshman in the SEC. So it's not like he doesn't have the talent. And the other part of it is, um, I just put something up on this today. Uh, Jay Huff is like, I don't know if there is a more perfect player. Like if you bought NBA 2K for college basketball and you went out and you wanted to create a player that is impossible to guard as the screener, in a in a ball screen action, you would go out and you would create Jay Huff because he shoots he like forty five percent from three. 
He's seven foot one. He's crazy athletic. He could put the ball on the floor. And like, there are some clips of him. You know, I, I don't know if you remember this play, but it sticks out in my mind when when Virginia right. played at Cameron Indoor Stadium last year. He had one play where he set a screen for Ty Jerome. Ty Jerome turned down the screen, drives to the corner. Someone helps. They kick it out to Jay Huff. He throws a pump fake. Takes one dribble and then takes off of two feet from like 13 feet from the rim outside of the lane coming from the wing and dunks it. Like, dude, like the wait, distance that that he, <laughs> yes, the distance that he took off from for that dunk is unbelievable. And it's like, how do you stop a guy like that that can, that can finish a play above the rim from that far away in a ball screen that can, when he can also shoot the way that he can shoot? So long story short, I think that Jay Huff is a guy that's going to be a breakout player. I think that Braxton Key could end up being really, really good this season. And I'm still mm-hmm. all in on Mamadi Diakite. Like, I have him as a second team All American. So, wow. Okay. Where, like, what is it? Like, tell me. Guide so me. Guys. I, I think need to know. if you're going to, I think you're spot on with Diakite. I think he's going to be impactful. I think the numbers that he'll put up this season are be very similar to the ones that he had during the March run. But I am right with you on the Jay Huff bandwagon. Uh, Luke Neer uh, from the ACC Degenerates podcast also was on that bandwagon last year. I love his skill set, and I think his skill set fits perfectly with what UVA is going to try to do offensively. And Bennett, to his credit, adjusted offensively last season after that upset against UMBC and put in some more screens, put in some more three pointers. Like he, 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 he adjusted. He didn't stay married to his system. So I think the fact that he has two bigs, and I think that the thing that still works kind of in college, and, and Gonzaga has done this uh, efficiently. Uh, multiple times the past couple of seasons is actually playing with two bigs. So I think, you know, when everybody's going to try to go small ball and, and, and copy what's happening in the NBA, I still think that two bigs holds a little value uh, in college hoops. And I think UVA is going to dis- demonstrate that this year, especially with Diakite and Huff leading the charge. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all in on them. Uh, I, I still have them in the top 10. A lot of people are kind of off that Virginia bandwagon. I, I'm not quite there yet. I just don't know who I should be like riding for being uh, their their all American, but I, I'm on Mamadi Diakite to start, so we'll see. I mean, and it right. might just be because Mamadi Diakite is so fun to say. It is, and it's a mouthful, but it does come out poetically. I'm with you on that. All right, let's uh, since you since you mentioned UVA and like maybe a team that might be underrated, Rob, give the listeners one team, one surprise team who you think owns enough like critical ingredients that's returning that might be up for like a sneaky Final Four run that maybe isn't getting like the love that they're deserving preseason. Where where's the consensus on Louisville? Is, like is that is that too um, is that no, too no, trendy? I think, that's, I think that's fine. I mean, you got Mac. I mean, you have a you know a preseason All American Noir. Like that, that that makes sense. Like I don't know why that would be a bad choice. Well, I mean, I I I think that they are a. Um, I have them in the top five. I'm not really sure. Right. Like I I don't know who else has come out with top twenty fives yet. I think that they're sneaky. I think that Florida. Is probably a team that's sneaky, but they're. I think they might be a little bit too trendy at this point. I, you know, I'm not. I'm probably giving like chalk options here. So, no, uh, that, that, that part's awesome. I think he's one of the most underrated point guards in the nation. I think he's really, really crafty, and I think he's the exact type of point guard that finds success. Not dissimilar from like you know Cassius Winston at Michigan State. I think he's that type of like talented point guard who can run the show and do a whole bunch of things that you don't think he can. Do. All right, I'm going to give you one more that is, I think, a little bit more off the board. Uh, Utah State. Ooh, okay, uh, sure. I'm a big, I'm a big Craig Smith guy. They bring back basically everyone from a team that won the Mountain West last year, that beat out Nevada yep. to win the Mountain West, that made it to the second round of the NCAA tournament. They got Nemius Keita back, who was their seven foot one guy. I do believe that he's healthy. You know, he he injured his knee over the summer. Right. I think it was at like the U twenty Euros. Yeah, I think it was international um, play. Yeah, and and it didn't end up being a torn ACL. I think he like tore his meniscus and just needed uh, I, I don't remember what it was but it wasn't serious it wasn't an ACL so as long as he's healthy and they bring back Sam Merrill they're going to be really really good they're going to roll through the Mountain West and I think with with everybody back all that experience a couple of potential NBA slash all American guys and Craig Smith is the coach like that's a really really good basketball team that's someone you got to keep an eye on in March that equation makes sense and I think Merrill is another one of those guys similar to Powell where that three you know the backed up three point line is going to affect him at all he's still going to jack it up and and uh, be really successful from that range. So uh, talk about the new three-point line. Like this is a, a thing that should have been done, I guess, for our sport. You know, teams like Nova and Auburn, you know, St. Mary's and, you know, uh, Utah State, like we just mentioned, are still going to like use the metrics and, and they'll, they're still going to hold like uh, that three-point shot with high value. What do you think is going to like, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's going to affect the sport greatly or do you think it's just going to be business as usual in, in college hoops with the pushback three-point line? 
I don't, I don't think it's really going to affect too much. Um, yeah. I think that it might create a little bit more space offensively so that it, it just, it's not as clogged up in the paint. You know, I think that's one of the issues that we have in college is that, you know, since the three point line is shorter, you don't have to, the defense doesn't get pulled out as far and it kind of clogs things up in the middle. You don't get as much, um, it, it's, it's not as hard uh, or it's not as easy to penetrate it as, um, as it is in the NBA. So I do think it's just going to create a little bit more space, but mostly I think it's, it's probably just going to be the same. You know, it's not like yeah. when you move that, it's moving back. What? Like, I think it's 12 inches. Is that what it is? Nine inches? Something yeah. like that. It's not, it's not. It's not like we're moving it back to the NBA line. So right. um, I do think that it's going to be – it'll create a little bit more space. It'll probably make it so that the three-point percentages go down, like tick down a little bit. But I don't think it's really going to be – you know, it's, I, I don't think it's going to change what the viewing experience is like. I just think it's going to make it a little bit more difficult to double-team in the post, a little bit different to help off, and maybe a little – like put a little bit more priority on shot-making and, and – the ability to shoot from the perimeter. So maybe someone like a Duke that doesn't really have all those guys that can uh, step out and make shots. I think that you might be in a little bit more trouble um, if you're a team like that. Yeah, I think it's going to put a premium on, like you mentioned, like shot creation, individual shot creation, uh, especially on the perimeter. But I also think it'll, you know, and I'm just thinking of like back one season, if like Zion had a little bit more room to drive, that would be like kind of crazy. So if you have like a great, guy that you can like drive and kick to and then he can you know be a secondary creator off the drive and kick i think that'd be really uh, i think it'd be interesting to watch too so you want to see what player might actually benefit in that role and then you know speaking of jack and the three we might need to know one under the radar like mid-major-ish player that is able to like you know warp a game or a season or maybe even like warp like a, a run in march who's a player returning that you think you have your eye on that might be able to have like one of those magical ish runs in the postseason that listeners might not know about yet, but you're going to educate them on. You got like one guy you're kind of paying attention to that might be mid major under the radar. I don't know how under the radar he is, but the guy that I love is Jordan Ford. Um, like sure. St. Mary's and like they're, they're a top 25 team this year. They bring basically everybody back. Um, I think that they are a reasonable bet to actually win the WCC this year simply because I'm not. 100% sold on Gonzaga's guard play, and I'm not 100% sold on the idea that Killian Tilly is ever going to be healthy. Um, right. It seems like every like we every time we turn around, he's got some other knee issue or yeah, that's super or unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that Jordan Ford is a guy, and like, look, he averaged like tw- I think he averaged 21 a game last year. Let me double check on that. Um, he, look, he put up really efficient numbers, and the pace that they play at doesn't like a lot for you know giant numbers, and even with that pace of play. He put up really efficient numbers from the field, from the three point line. Of course, he shoots it incredible from the line. We, you know, we, you know, just, you know, one conversation back, we're talking about a premium on shot creators. Like he's exactly that. Like he can shoot those one foot floaters. He can create on the perimeter. He can create for others. Like he is that exact player who might actually thrive with a further three point line. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I've had this conversation with Sam Bassini of the athletic before, and I think he has legitimate potential as an NBA player. You know, we've yeah. seen guys point guards from that St. Mary's Randy Bennett system have success uh, in the NBA. And, and, you know, I, I don't think it's, I hesitate to compare somebody to someone like Patty Mills just because. Uh, when well, you're coming yeah. from like St. Mar- St. Mary's, like that is your absolute ceiling if you end up being a guy that can play in the NBA 10 years, right? But I do right. think and, that and, he, and the success that he had, you know, overseas, uh, look at the success that he had in, in, in the international uh, circuit this season. I mean, he, he killed it for them. Like I said, they bring everybody back. They got another kid named Malik Fitz who Love is Fitz. the thing about him and the reason why I'm kind of bullish on him making St. Mary's be competitive with some of these higher uh, power conference teams and more athletic teams is like, he is that kind of combo forward. That's really, re- really athletic. He's, he is a high major foot player. Ready trans- I think it was South Florida. He transferred in from, but yeah. he's not like normally when you think about St. Mary's, you kind of think about like Australians that are not exactly super fast that are going to make a lot of threes that do a lot of fundamental stuff. Like they, you just think about like those really white teams. Shock like, Landau. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he he is the guy that can step in and can be a little bit of – he makes the matchups play better for St. Mary's, and he lets them match up against some of these bigger, more athletic teams. And I do think that he is – like those two combined, uh, you know, I don't know how, how many uh, better one-two punches you're going to find, and especially in the mid-major ranks, but more or less anywhere in the country than those two. Right. So I'm really bullish on St. Mary's. I'm really bullish on Jordan Ford. And he's going to have at least one game this year 
on national television where he goes off for like 35 or 40 points. And I cannot wait to see it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very there for that. And I'm very there for the way that he's going to make those shots because you're going to like shake your head at a couple of those shot attempts, like one of those like, no, 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 no. Oh, OK, good. That worked for you. And I'm, I'm right with you. It fits. I think he has a little swag to his game that usually St. Mary's might not own uh, due to their team personality and characteristic. And he can shoot it from deep. He can create off the bounce. And, he, you know, like we mentioned uh, before, Diakite, like he can guard multiple positions on the perimeter. So I'm really impressed with Fitz. I think he might have, you know, some sort of future too. All right, Rob, let's get you out of here on a couple one, a couple fun ones. You know, we here at Screen the Screener enjoy a solid craft beer every now and then and a couple sounds for the ear. So uh, what's one of the nicest adult beverages you came across uh, this off season during the summer for the listeners to look out for? So I, I live in um, in South Jersey now, and there's a brewery uh, that is in the very southern tip of South Jersey called the Cape May Brewery. Yeah, people probably know what Cape May is, uh, mm-hmm. but there's a Cape May Brewing Company, and I've just torn through more or less. I'm a, I'm a big IPA guy, and I've very torn good. through every IPA that they have, and I have not come across one that I don't like yet. Like I should probably be sponsored by Cape May brewing at this point with how much that I'm actually drinking. Like it's, it's probably, uh, I don't want to know what I spent on Cape May beers. This no, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to reveal that value, but I, it sounds like you're pretty invested. Yes. I, I'm a, I'm a very big Cape May brewing guy. So if, if anybody like ever makes it to Jersey or the Philly area or Delaware, that if you can find any Cape May brewing beers, especially their IPAs, uh, you need to go out and get them because they, they, they have not let me down yet. The one that uh, I came across recently, I was out with uh, some family for uh, my brother-in-law's birthday, and we ran across uh, Lawson Sip of Sunshine on tap, which I've had very Ooh. rare. It's cool to find that in Jersey. Uh, and then how about one LP or one artist you've been enjoying listening to um, when you're not working like crazy on an AAC preview or something like that? <laughs> um, real quick, like the, the best thing about Sip of Sunshine is Ooh. there's one spot in the uh, at Penn Station in New York City. Okay. I have no idea how to get there because I can never actually like find my way around Penn Station. But like it's right near where you come up to go uh to go to Madison Square Garden. There's one of like one of those pizza places has yeah. sip of sunshine, tall boys, and they're like four fifty a piece. And it's every brilliant. time I go to Penn Station on the on the on the train ride home, you gotta buy two of them. Four fifty a piece for, for a tall boy sip of sunshine. Like that's they're basically that's even order free. Yeah. yeah. I think you stumbled on a little bit of a gold mine there. Wow. Yes, okay. I did. And I, I have no idea where it is, what it is, uh, like what it's called. But I do know um, kind of how to get there once I get my bearings. And like the, near, it's near the Amtrak station. I'll tell you that much. All right, um, in terms of class, like, you never have to hit that. Uh, and then how about one LP or artist that you enjoyed listening to uh, during the off season? So the what I've been listening to nonstop has been the the new Sturgill Simpson album, um, Sound sure. of Fury. Like I was, I I like Sturgill. Um, I didn't love. The, the most recent album, whatever it was, he has four albums. His third one was just okay. I thought the second one was really, really good. And his first album was fine. Um, right. But this new one called Sound and Fury, like I, I thought I was going to end up hating it because it, like, it's just kind of like this play on like 80s, like metal synth bands or whatever. And, uh, it actually is like, it's really, really, really damn good. And I've been listening to it probably like from front to back, start to finish. Uh, 10 or 12 times already this year. It's just, it's such, it's great writing music. It's great. Uh, you get in the car, put the windows down. It's great driving music. So I'm, a, I, I'm, I really am into this new Sturgill Simpson album. I don't know if you're a Sturgill guy. No, nah, I'm a Sturgill guy, but I have not invested that much time and given it that much listening. I'm a front to back listen guy too for albums. So I'll definitely have to do that. Um, the one that I've been listening to front to back over and over again, it was released earlier. So your citizen cope. Uh, heroin and helicopters uh i feel like it could be his best album he's released in you know, f- five or six but i've been, been really enjoying that one as far as uh uh new, newer music goes uh, rob thanks for a couple minutes thanks for educating the listeners on everything from college hoops all the way down to where to find sip of sunshine and penn station awesome conversation totally appreciate you giving the screen screener podcast a little time here yeah no problem man and make sure everybody you got to remember they're not strippers if they have clothes on, they are dancers on stripper poles. I think we need to make sure we're very clear about that distinction. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Salatra. Gatsu. Lotsi, everybody out there.